Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest started his career as a journalist at the Washington Post and Miami Herald. He left journalism and moved to New York City to pursue an interest in books and the theater where he wrote books and lyrics for musicals. He's been an editor and publisher at Random House and Hashid Book Group. He believes books can change the world and he is the president and CEO of one of the most prominent publishers in the world, Simon & Schuster. Please welcome John Carp. John, it's great to see you. Welcome to Take Command. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, John, you're someone I've gotten a chance to get to know over the past couple of years. You've certainly had an extremely impressive and eclectic career. I know you started as a journalist at the Washington Post, the Miami Herald. You came to New York City early in your career to pursue an interest in books and the theater. You've written the books and lyrics for musicals. You've been an editor and publisher, and now you are the CEO of one of the most prominent publishers in the world. Share a little bit of this about your background and some of the key things that led you to the role you're in today. Well, I grew up in suburban New Jersey. Both of my parents were excellent influences on me. There were books in every room of our house. My dad was a lawyer and a banker. My mom was a teacher for 25 years. So I think usually if you add lawyer plus teacher, you usually get book editor. And I was always interested in reading and in theater. If I ever wrote a book about myself, the title might be Last Orphan Cut. In eighth grade, I auditioned for the regional production of Oliver. I sang and I acted and, and then it came time to dance. And after the dancing, I was the last orphan cut. My whole life would have probably taken a different direction if I'd been in that because it was the Paper Mill Playhouse, a really good regional theater. But I've always loved books. I just gravitated toward it. I was the editor of my high school newspaper, my college newspaper. I was even the editor of my summer camp newspaper where I published an expose about leeches in the Camp Lake. What is it about writing that has connected with you so viscerally? I love stories. I love language. For whatever reasons, I've just always loved books. I've just always loved to read. And I've loved movies and theater and all other forms of storytelling as well. But I just think there's something about communing with a book that's an incredibly powerful personal experience. You're basically listening to another person tell you everything they know for hours upon hours. It can be a transformative experience. Certainly it can be, and it is a form of art. It is that author expressing the creative power from within them and expressing a story or whatever it is that they're writing. And you've brought to life some incredible books. We'll talk about that in a little bit. As you look back at your career and the different things led you to where you are today, what were some of the key milestones? As you look back, what were some of the even defining moments in your career? In terms of leadership, being the editor of the Brown Daily Herald when I was in college was a formative experience for me. And I've been thinking a lot about it even today because I was named the editor-in-chief of the Brown Daily Herald in 1985. And at the time, there was a lot of protest going on. But right before I became editor, the newspaper was picketed, actually, by Black students who didn't think we were covering them very well. And they thought that the newspaper and the university, by extension, were really guilty of institutional racism. And so in 1985, I was confronted with this. It really uh, shook me up and it moved me and I agreed with what they were saying. I thought that the black students had a lot of really valid arguments. The newspaper was not very representative. There was not a lot of diversity there. And we really made strides over the next year to ameliorate that and to cover black issues better and to have more black staffers. And I think about it now nearly 35 years later. Obviously, things have gotten better, but we're still having a lot of the same conversations about systemic racism. So that was actually a core formative issue for me. And I think just generally, when you get a chance to be the leader of a college newspaper like that, it really does shape you and stay with you. I mean, I remember once I was talking to uh, somebody who was a little bit younger and who was trying to decide whether to get more involved in the paper. And I told her all of my doubts 
And she quit the next week. <laughs> it was at that point that I realized, well, gee, you know, maybe I was a little bit too much information and maybe a leader has to be a little bit more careful and confident. That was a very early key experience. You were transparent with that person. And certainly that's one of the things we encourage people to do to some degree, to be authentic. And going back even to the things that you had heard from the student protesters, you listened. What other kinds of takeaways did you have from that experience? Because you talked about it being so formative. And how did even some of those things that happened then influence you today? I learned a lot about how to stay organized. I learned how to build a group. The staff of the newspaper grew while I was running it. So that was a good thing. We actually produced more. The paper was bigger while I was doing it. I remember that. And I took a lot of pleasure in that. But generally, just the idea of leading an organization like that, putting out a newspaper every day, it was exhilarating. What does leadership mean to you? If you think back about that experience or your experience now, I mean, how do you define leadership? What is the role of the leader in your mind? If you were to boil it down to a sentence or two. I would say that it's looking forward with vision in a way that sets an example, in a way that sets a worthy example too, and gives people a shared purpose and a sense of meaning. Talk a little bit more about that. So expand on that, if you would. You talked about not just the vision, but also the worthy example and something that gives people purpose. So how do you implement that as a leader? What is an example of how that manifests itself through your leadership? I'm a big believer in trying to look forward and look ahead as much as possible. I'm not a big fan of looking sideways or looking at the competition. And I realize that Sometimes you have to know what your competitors are doing in order to contextualize, in order to make sure you're not overreacting to something or that you're not going too far to an extreme. But I generally don't like to look at the competition. I think that it's better to be operating from a core of what you think is necessary. And that should be based on your own vision of what you're striving toward. And that's why I do think that striving forward <laughs> is a good idea. Now, it may be that there are times when you actually have to look backwards, I guess, to get back to what you think your core is or what your values are, or what you stand for. But I think for the most part, if you're driven toward growth and you're just sort of naturally a believer in progress, then I think looking forward and looking straight ahead is a good approach. Seems like a big part of this for you is looking forward and being rooted in values. You've got core values that guide you as you look ahead and try to inspire other people. What are some of the core values you've operated under over the years of your leadership? Well, a lot of this is very specific to working and publishing. So for me, a core value is the fact that in my gut, in my heart, without any kind of reservation, I love books. I love books. I believe in books. I think they make the world a better place. I think some books are better than others. <laughs> I want to support the books that I love. I want to publish books to a broad range of audiences. So I'm the leader of a very specific kind of company, a book publishing company. It's funny because people sometimes call publishing companies publishing houses. And I've never actually understood the origin of publishing houses, but just as houses are built brick by brick, publishing houses are built book by book. And so the vision that a book publisher has to have might be a little bit different than the vision that somebody like Jeff Bezos might have. I think about Jeff Bezos a lot, first of all, because he's transformed the book industry, but also because he was born the same year that I was born in, in 1964. And we share a similar trajectory in terms of our lives. And we both grew up watching Star Trek. He decided that he wanted to start a space company. I decided that I'd be quite happy publishing Star Trek novels. So clearly I was just on the book path and I'm obsessively interested in books. So a lot of my values as a leader really stem from that core. And if you love books and you want to put them out in the world, that gives you a lot of direction and focus. So what is the role that you see books having in the larger dialogues of society these days? I mean, clearly there's been a lot of controversy about some books that have been published or not published and that kind of thing. What role do you see books playing in kind of this larger discussion, so to speak? 
It's an interesting question because there are some people who, like me, believe that books can change the world and make the world a better place. And I think when you're having that experience as a reader, when you're locked into what a writer is saying and you think of the world in a different way, or it makes you take a certain kind of action, or it opens you up to an idea you'd never considered before, you think, wow, that was powerful. That was transformative. If, however, you believe in the power of books for good, you might also believe that they can have a truly negative impact if they introduce the wrong ideas or they popularize the wrong voices. And so then you get into a situation where people are actually trying to limit what's published and extract voices from the culture. And I'm not sure that I want to do that very often. There are plenty of authors we don't want to publish. There are plenty of times where we've said, we can't do this. Some of them have recently made news, actually. But, you know, we are here to publish voices. We're here to broaden people through a diversity of views. And I would argue that the idea that books have negative impact, I'm not so sure that that's as true as the opposite. I think that the power of books to have a positive impact is far greater than the negativity that a book could cause. And so I think that it's misplaced energy. And I also think that it's kind of a shallow binary kind of thinking to assume that we have to subtract books. And I'd much rather add them. Certainly, if we think about books historically, they've added to the public discussion. They've gotten people thinking about and debating different ideas and so forth. And like you said, I mean, books certainly can play an important role in opening minds. From a leadership standpoint, certainly you've been in a position this last year of having to make some difficult decisions regarding books. It seems like if you published or you didn't publish, you knew you were going to have some people who are going to be unhappy. From a leadership standpoint, what advice would you give to leaders who have difficult decisions to make and know that people aren't going to be happy with those decisions? What are some of the things you've learned even over the past year of making some of those tough decisions? So what's been going on at a lot of companies, and certainly Simon & Schuster is one of them, is that there are employees who want the company to be a force for social justice and for progressive change in the country. And those employees are looking at some of the books we're publishing and saying, you know, they don't set the right tone. They are actually harmful in ways. They're hurtful in ways. And they don't want any association with them. And publishers feel a responsibility to publish a diversity of voices. And so it was a very interesting conflict because on the one hand, you have a commitment to diversity and inclusion. And on the other hand, you have people saying, exclude these voices. And I would just argue that you can never be inclusive if you're excluding voices. That said, I do think that leaders have a responsibility to ventilate these issues and have these conversations. So one of the things that I really try to do is, first of all, I met with every single person in the company when I became CEO in groups of 10. We had these sessions called Java with John, and I opened up the forum and they could ask any question they wanted. And a lot of these topics came up in the conversations. So I had talked about it with people in small groups. I also tried to refer employees to a couple of books that I thought were particularly illuminating on some of these questions. And we had a town hall about it with these authors. And one of the authors is Amanda Ripley. She wrote a book called High Conflict. It's all about how to transcend conflict in your lives. And it's a really, really smart account of how we get past the point where we're always at loggerheads with each other, where we're talking past each other. And the other book was called Let's Talk About Hard Things by Anna Sale. And Anna pointed out that one of the reasons that people usually don't understand or agree with each other, it usually has to do with just sort of understanding the context that the other person is coming from. So let's talk about hard things was all about understanding context. High conflict was all about trying to sort of go to the balcony. That's a phrase from the book where you're looking down at what the argument is from the balcony and you're trying to get perspective on it. And it just seemed to me that as these conversations about the tension between free expression and a diversity of voices 
and social justice and having an inclusive work environment, those issues were basically in conflict with each other. And it was all about the context of the person, depending on how you viewed it. And I was fascinated by it, actually. I just wanted to keep talking about it with everybody. We had a long town hall meeting, and I just stayed until the last question was asked because I thought that it was really important for people to feel heard. And I also thought that it was an entirely constructive positive conversation. I think it's a very healthy debate. When I was in grad school, I wrote a term paper on the New Republic in the 1920s, right around the time of the Progressive Era. It was a culture of debate at the New Republic. And people like Walter Lippmann, they were advising the president privately, and they were writing columns, and they were disagreeing with each other about what the future of the nation should be. And not everybody agreed, but they all got along. And I think similarly, publishing houses can be like that too. Sometimes these conversations are really hard to have. That's why we are in the business of ideas and language and expression. And we have to have these conversations. And if we can't have them at a publishing house, what hope is there of having them in other parts of the country? I admired your leadership during these difficult times. I think your heart is on doing the right thing and listening to people and trying to value different perspectives It's not always easy, though. You've led during some challenges, and I've admired how you've done that. One of the things I am anticipating is that some of the decisions you've had to make may have been stressful. Certainly, they're not easy decisions. And one of the things people often assume is that CEOs are unencumbered by stress and worry. They're confident, they're decisive, and so forth. How do you handle stress in your life and worry? Or is there a time or an example you can think of of something that happened in a strategy you used to address that stress? Well, yeah, I once edited a book about burnout and performance and the author of it, uh, Stephen Berglass, he said that there is such a thing as good stress. So not all stress is bad. (laughs) If you're intellectually engaged in what the challenge is, I kind of enjoy that, that sort of uh, adrenaline that you get from trying to solve a problem. I don't think that my answers to your question are going to be particularly revelatory. Like a lot of people, I like to take walks. I get exercise. I personally love a good nap. I've got pretty good blood pressure. I don't get too rattled that easily. And the kinds of issues that I'm facing in the book business, I think are to some degree, maybe a little bit easier. <laughs> no lives are at stake, I don't think. And also the people are very nice. You know, when they say that it's a polite profession. I think that that's still the case. That's a good thing. Who are some people who have inspired you to be a stronger leader? Well, I will tell you the story of one person who's inspired me, who I have rarely uh, talked about. And his name is Don Katz, Donald Katz. And in the early 1990s, I had an idea for a book. I went to a literary agent. I wanted to publish a book about the convergence of digital technology. And this was in the early 1990s. And this was at a time when people were saying there's going to be such a thing as video on demand. And I thought, well, there were all these companies that seemed to be getting into this. Time Warner, I think Time was starting to get into it. I don't even know if they'd merged with Warner yet. Anyway, the agent, Binky Urban, suggested Don Katz to write it. Don had written a book about Sears called The Big Store. And he'd written another wonderful book called Home Fires. And he was a terrific narrative nonfiction writer, very much writing in sort of the tradition of Gay Talese and Tom Wolfe and David Halberstam, sort of next generation journalist. So I signed on up to write this book. You know, we knew it was going to take him many, many years to do. And he went away. We did one book on Nike that he wrote called Just Do It about the corporate culture of Nike, which was a terrific book. And then he went away and he did this, but he never wrote the book. Because while he was researching the convergence of digital technologies, he got interested in audiobooks. And he started studying audio and he realized that there was an opportunity to digitize audiobooks. And he started a company, and that company was Audible. <laughs> and I watched Don go from a book author and journalist to an entrepreneur before my eyes. I saw him, you know, get Audible off the ground. I was one of the first investors in it. Obviously, uh, he subsequently sold it to Amazon, and it is the largest force in audio publishing today. And it's really changed reading for a lot of people. And he's brought books to 
probably millions of people who otherwise might not have uh, discovered them. So uh, it's an extraordinary accomplishment. And I saw that up close and I saw Don's restless curiosity and his energy and his tremendous persistence. He just wouldn't quit. And there were many times when Audible was on the ropes. He just stayed ahead of the curve long enough to really build it into a force in publishing. So I think it's a fascinating story. And I think it's a great story of leadership. Also, he based a company in Newark, which I really, really respected. And he's done a tremendous amount for the community. And he supported schools and literacy, the Newark Public Library. So three cheers for Don Katz and Audible. Well, Don sounds like an inspirational leader and certainly a visionary. It's interesting too, just on a personal note, I find myself consuming more books now than ever before because there are more modalities to do this. So I will run and listen to a book on Audible. I might have the same book on Kindle and be able to pick that up where I left off on Audible. And if I really, really like the book, I've also bought the hard copy too. And in fact, sometimes I will just give those away. So it's not uncommon for me to buy the same version of the book in three different formats. That's real vision. That, you know, the people who created these new distribution opportunities, whether it's through audio or ebooks, I wish I were that kind of a visionary. I mean, for years, I would wake up every morning thinking, when am I going to have that idea? But actually, most of my ideas have been about the actual books themselves. I mean, it's interesting to me because obviously, in the early 1990s, I did understand that there was going to be this convergence of digital technology, but it didn't occur to me to actually start a company. I just wanted to publish the book on it. Well, you've certainly played a critical role in this process, Chen. So maybe not being the creator of the technology, but you're certainly supporting that. Let me ask you about publishing and creativity, because what you're really doing is working with an author to take a concept to reality and really trying to discern what ideas, what books are going to be the most successful. How do you encourage creativity? How do you get that sense about where to focus and where not to focus? I hate to fall back on Potter Stewart's comment about pornography, about how you just know it when you see it. But I do sort of think that creativity is the same way. And there's just something about the way a writer expresses herself or himself. There's something about the way the words come off the page the way the ideas sparkle. And you just feel like you're in the presence of somebody who's really interesting, who you want to keep listening to. And that's always what I'm attracted to. And it doesn't matter whether it's fiction or nonfiction, whether it's entertainment or something that's more polemical. I just want to be in the presence of that person. And I'm curious and I have more questions for that person. You know, curiosity, I do think, is one of the core elements of management and leadership. And the older I get and the more I read and the more I learn, the more I realize just how foundational and fundamental curiosity is. I mean, one of the most inspiring people I've worked with is Brian Grazer. And Brian did a book with us called A Curious Mind. And it was based upon something he'd been doing his whole career, where he asked a total stranger to have lunch with him. And he did this basically every two weeks, methodically over a period of decades. And a lot of his movie ideas came from those curiosity conversations. So I looked at Brian's example and I thought that that's how you lead. You lead by just sort of having an open-ended approach to your work. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that, you know, when I was looking back at Dale Carnegie's example, Asking questions was also core to what he did. And maybe one of the first people to suggest that you can really lead just by asking questions. It's non-confrontational. It's open. And I do think that openness and curiosity, those are core values. Those are values that I would like to be core to Simon & Schuster and to any other endeavor that I'm working on. Well, it seems like those values really are common to so many great leaders Sometimes people think that the leader comes in and says, this is what we're going to do and just takes charge. It seems to me that many of the great leaders I've interviewed on this podcast have said the same thing that you're saying, which is other people have great ideas. I need to listen and value those ideas and see what I can learn in that process. Right. And I also worry about the danger of people who feel like they have to manage up. One of the things I really try to discourage is, you know, people feeling that they need to do that, that they need to in any way 
flatter me or show me that they like me. It's nice, of course, when people like you. And I know that that's also at the root of Dale Carnegie. But I also think that just in terms of having a productive work relationship with somebody, I'm more interested in, in showing that I'm concerned about what they're doing and that I care about that. And again, it sort of comes from that core love of books. I mean, people know that I really care about the books. You mentioned Dale Carnegie a number of times. You are really the steward of Dale Carnegie's books. Simon & Schuster has been a partner of ours for 85 years, a great partner. What role do you see how to win friends and influence people, how to stop worrying, playing in society moving forward? Well, first of all, I want to take a step back and just talk about how the book came to be, because that in and of itself is sort of an example of what makes a publishing company good. It was actually the brainchild of Leon Shimkin, who was one of the top executives at Simon & Schuster. And he had heard Dale Carnegie speaking, and Dale didn't want to write the book at first. And so Leon Shimkin brought a stenographer and just got everything down that Dale had been saying. And that was the basis of how to win friends and influence people. It's one of those books that people feel they need to read, not just to improve their lives, but to actually understand America. When I see the influence that it's had, I mean, it's remarkable because obviously the book is, as you say, it's over you know 85 years old, but it still speaks to people with a universality and a profundity. I was looking at an online comment Just the other day, a reader had posted from India and said, you know, this book may be old and it may be American, but everything in it is relevant to my life today. And I think that's extraordinary. So I think that it can be read as a foundational look at what really lasts. And obviously, there are going to be parts that will not be quite as relevant to the present moment, but you can still see the core truths that actually sustain over time. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And that's one of the observations I've had, which is the same as the one you just shared, traveling around the world and being in countries all over the world and seeing how universal the principles and ideas of Dale Carnegie are. They resonate to people across culturally and have an incredible impact on people and societies. I think that when something lasts that long, there's a reason for it. Most books don't last. Probably 95% of the books that get published after 10 years, they're no longer relevant. It's sad. I used to think that books were forever, but actually really only a small fraction of them are. So it really is significant that people are still reading Dale Carnegie all these years later. And he clearly was somebody who articulated core values and core truths about how to communicate, how to influence people, obviously, and how to grow personally. It's interesting because the book was positioned as a self-help book, still is often. And yet, when you talked about the principles of leadership that have guided you, listening, giving honest and sincere appreciation, valuing other people, those are all things that he talked about in many ways. This is really a seminal leadership book and has been for decades. It is. What role do you see the book having moving forward? Someone might say, hey, this is an 85-year-old book. The world is different. If you look 10, 20 years ahead, especially as someone who loves books as you do, what type of impact do you think How to Win Friends can have or should have moving forward? Well, I think that, first of all, there are ways of updating it and there are ways of expanding its reach. For example, one of the things that Dale Carnegie says in How to Win Friends is, you know, to avoid arguments, right? That in such a contentious culture is something that we really need to expand upon and talk more about. Obviously, we're continuing to publish more books with your organization. And I think that books that can address how to win friends and influence people online, how to win friends and influence people if you're younger, even though the principles are timeless, I do think that some of the situations change. And so how do you have an argument online that doesn't actually wind up you know, blowing up? It's a great question. And going back, the principles can still guide those kinds of answers. You also talked about new books and new ways of approaching those principles. We just, together with Simon & Schuster, announced the launch of an exciting new book called Take Command. You were an important part of that book moving forward. Talk a little bit about that book and what excited you about the concept of that book. 
Well, I think that, first of all, the idea that there are new generations of readers who haven't yet really learned about Dale Carnegie. And this is a book that you're writing with his grandson, if I'm correct. Yep, Michael Crumb. So the idea of the two of you taking Dale Carnegie's ideas and expanding upon them, elaborating on them, putting them in a contemporary context. I think that's exciting. And I think it's really relevant. Really, you've got to look at Dale Carnegie as kind of a public popular philosopher. And in the same way that we're still talking about what Socrates or Plato meant, we can talk about what Dale Carnegie meant, which of his ideas are still relevant and which ones need to be adjusted or tweaked a little bit. So one of the things you've talked about is how much you love books. You're passionate, you're obsessive about books. What are some of the most exciting projects you've worked on? Any favorites? I'll give you three. Probably the author who has influenced me the most in my life is John Irving. When I was in high school, I read The World According to Garp. I think it's just a coincidence that my name rhymes with his, but I did actually have my high school newspaper column was called The World According to Garp. I've read every single John Irving novel. And when I was at Random House, his editor was a guy named Joe Fox. And Joe um, knew I was a huge fan. I went into Joe's office one day, I said, did you realize you were working with a genius? And (laughs) he didn't really answer, but he did give me John's manuscript when it came in. And I read it and I said, we must publish this. And I wrote this three page memo and Joe sent it on to John. And he told John, if anything ever happens to me, this guy should be your editor. When Joe passed away, I was still at Random House, but John took one look at me and he said that I looked younger than his son and he just couldn't imagine me being his editor. You know, I was heartbroken. But about 15 years later, I did get to be his editor and I've edited three of his novels and it's been one of the great experiences of my life to work with somebody who's had such a huge influence on me. And I think that John Irving is a great American writer. More comically, I was uh, assigned once to work with Manuel Noriega He's the only dictator I've ever worked with. He was in prison at the time. The publisher of Random House at the time, Harry Evans, thought that Noriega might have some insights into President Bush and why President Bush wanted to invade Panama. So it was sort of meant to be an expose. Actually, General Noriega was very polite. The only reason I mentioned that I worked with him is because it will then allow me to tell any author who's misbehaving that I can say, well, I worked with General Manuel Noriega, and right now you're behaving worse. I haven't had to use that very many times. I'll mention an author who I really admired, a guy named Billy Shore, political advisor to Senator Gary Hart, and started his own organization called Share Our Strength. And I edited two books by Billy, and they were about a social entrepreneurship and about building organizations that made the world better. And I just really was inspired by him. The books were not huge bestsellers by any stretch of the imagination, but they stayed with me. And Billy's example stayed with me too. So I want to mention that too. Terrific. Three great examples. And who knew that you'd worked with Manuel Noriega? (laughs) It's not something I talk about very often. So Jen, one question I know lots of people would love to hear from you is whether you have any recommendations for people who want to write a book, want to publish a book. Well, my first recommendation is that you should take your time. Unless you have something that is right fresh from your experience, if you've had some extraordinary experience and it needs to be shared with the world immediately because only you had that experience, and obviously that's something that should be rushed right out. And actually those books are usually easier to write because if something extraordinary has happened to you, it kind of comes out real quickly. But otherwise, I'm a big believer in authority. I think writers should really know their subject well. John Irving takes years to write his novels, and he really knows what he wants to say when he writes a novel. And all the nonfiction books that I've really loved, they've been written from the perspective of somebody who has really studied a subject and gained a command of it. The title of your next book is Take Command, and I actually think that that's excellent advice for authors. Authors should take command. And I can tell when a writer is in command of his or her own material. And nothing is more satisfying than putting yourself into the hands of somebody who is telling you a story and they know exactly where they're taking you. They know which details to share and which details to leave out. They know how to tantalize you. They know where to land their big idea. Those are techniques 
that only come through a lot of work, a lot of research, and multiple drafts usually. I read that Malcolm Gladwell, a writer I've never worked with, but who I've read for years, he writes 10 drafts of every chapter. And that's why his books are so effective, because he's really thought about the very best way to tell his story. Great advice. Great advice for aspiring writers. John, you're in a role right now, especially for someone who loves what you do as much as you do, that gives you a lot of opportunities. What excites you the most about your work right now? What really kind of fires you up as you look ahead? Well, I decided when I became CEO, I thought, well, what is the message that I most want to communicate to Simon & Schuster? And my mantra became, let's talk about the books. I didn't want to talk about the process. I didn't want to talk about the business. I wanted to actually talk about the books. And then I thought, well, okay. Uh, So we started bringing in authors to talk to us more about the books. And we started reading books together and having regular sessions where we talked about the books with the authors. But that still wasn't enough. And I realized that I wanted to lead by example. So I started a video series, which I call The Word According to Carp. And every week or so, I talk about a different book. And it was a decision to put myself out there that way. I mean, generally speaking, CEOs don't do that. There was a little bit of concern that maybe the authors I wasn't talking about might take offense. It's also a commitment of time because I actually read the books. But I just thought that if I really wanted to lead by example, and I really meant what I said about talking about the books, I ought to do it myself. So that's been very exciting to be able to do this. And I hope that people seem to like it. We'll see whether uh, I can sustain it. But that's been very exciting for me. Terrific. What are you reading right now? Is there one particular book you're, you're reading right now? I just finished a novel that I absolutely adored called Fellowship Point by a writer named Alice Elliott Dark. She has been writing it for over a 17-year period. And it's the story of a friendship over 70 years. These two women from the Philadelphia area move up to Maine. And it is so beautifully and brilliantly crafted. It's a novel filled with wisdom and meaning. It won't be coming out until um, early 2022. You can't buy it yet, but it's a fantastic novel, A Fellowship Point by Alice Elliott Dark. So, I mean, that's just one. I mean, I could go on and on, as you can tell. So, John, thank you. This has been a truly enlightening discussion. As you think about our listeners, is there any kind of advice you'd give them about leadership or how they might advance in their career or something that you have found valuable for yourself? Well, obviously, I believe you should read, read widely, read voraciously. I believe that you should ask a lot of questions. I think you should ask questions relentlessly. I had a really good boss, a predecessor uh, as CEO, Carolyn Reedy, and I have never had anybody ask me as many questions as Carolyn Reedy asked me. So those are two things. And then I think also you should be clear about what you want to accomplish. That may sound like an obvious thing, but I really think that if you have a sense of purpose about what it is that you want to accomplish, everything really stems from that. Sounds great. Well, good thoughts and good final advice. John, thank you again for being with me today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us at the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.